Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, departmental day. Uh, it hasn't uh, happened yet, but it's already a success. Uh, we had uh, such a, a large interest in this day uh, that we had many more people that were interested that we could actually accommodate uh, in the room. Um, so I'm really looking forward to a set of uh, uh, stimulating and uh, very important talks that we have uh, today with uh, a lot of uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, the day today uh, was um, uh, it's, uh, put together in partnership with the Réseau Québécois de Recherche sur les Suicides, les Troubles de l'Humain et Troubles Associés. Donc, merci beaucoup au Réseau pour uh, uh, son soutien à cette journée ici. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the people, the organizers that put this day together, uh, in particular to Dr. Gabriela Gobi and Marco Layton, who are our co-directors of the Departmental Continuing uh, Medical Education Program. So thank you very much to both of you. And of course, as well, to the support of uh, our um, uh, excellent uh, people in the department, uh, uh, led by Kazue, who did a fantastic job uh, making sure that everything, every detail, uh, is uh, spotless and work well. Thank you very much. So I'd like to um, uh, invite now uh, Marco Layton, who will be uh, introducing the speakers. Uh, before I do so, I just to let you know that uh, there is a um, live recording of the day today, and then there is going to be a video available uh, if you want to um, see again uh, the contents of the talks and uh, for those that couldn't uh, make it. Thank you very much. Marco? Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Gustavo. So, the forthcoming legalization of cannabis is arguably the single most important topic in psychopharmacology today. Roughly half of Canadian adults have already used cannabis, and 10% of them will develop at one point a cannabis use disorder. Medical marijuana is a widely accepted concept in the general public, but with a few exceptions, strikingly little clinical research has been done, putting many of you in this room in a difficult situation, advising patients to request your endorsement and advice. Indeed, most biomedical research to date is focused on the adverse effects of cannabis use. Today's speakers will address each of these issues, both the good and the bad. Our first speaker today, Professor Benedict Fisher, is no stranger to the topic. He's a senior scientist and epidemiologist at the University of Toronto and CAMH, and co-author of the 2014 CAMH Statement on Cannabis Policy and the important book, Cannabis Policy Moving Beyond the Stalemate. I recommend both publications highly. Today, he'll provide an update on the social implications of cannabis legalization in a talk entitled Cannabis and Public Health, Basic Evidence and Implications for Interventions and policy. Thank you, Benedict. Do you know how to get this up? I think I just need to hit that button. Yes. I remember correctly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation uh, to your fine event. It's a pleasure to be here. It's not very often that I give a talk in Canada next to a Baroque statue or a pillar, uh, so that's uh, adding to the very lovely environment here. So it's, it's great to be here. <clears throat> so you, you see that I changed my title a little bit, but what I will be speaking to you this afternoon is really about cannabis and public health primarily from a number of, of different angles. First of all, uh, no conflicts of interest to declare, to get that out of the way. And then I was thinking about the learning objectives and I thought maybe that visually sums it up actually quite nicely. Um, obviously we have a lot of things to think about with respect to cannabis in, in Canada and what I really want to do is 
primarily give you a little bit of an idea about what the relevance of cannabis is for public health, talk a bit about the health implications on an individual and a public health level, uh, and then talk through the basic concepts and parameters of legalizations and what we know or what we expect uh, in terms of them influencing health outcomes. There's obviously a lot of things that we don't know, but also to familiarize you a little bit with the many almost infinite variables and determinants uh, that will likely influence those outcomes that we yet have to define or, or to adjust in the specific Canadian situation and um, to understand where things will actually go in terms of the impact of this big social experiment. And then I'll talk a little bit about a population health initiative that we've launched, the lower risk cannabis use guidelines at the very end. So a little bit of historical context just in a nutshell. Cannabis history of a century summarized in one minute. Cannabis was uh, made illegal in Canada in 1923, actually at the time without major problems, uh, but it was added to the new and emerging prohibition law, mostly based on information and propaganda from the United States. It then was put, uh, included in the international treaties, the single convention in 1961 that basically defined globally all the illegal drugs. It's quite interesting that we're at that point even efforts to make a specific schedule for cannabis that would put that would have put cannabis uh, at a level even above heroin and cocaine because a lot of key people thought that it was even more dangerous than those particularly harmful narcotics that didn't happen but that's how cannabis ended on the international control regime and basically defined prohibition globally for the forthcoming decades. It was also a promise at the time that use of cannabis would be eliminated as soon as possible, but in any case within the next 25 years, that would have been in 1986. That clearly did not uh, successfully happen at all. Um, then, of course, we had a massive expansion of cannabis use and enforcement starting in the late 60s to 1970s. There were tens of thousands of arrests of primarily middle class young people. That's when the controversy really actively began around the harms of cannabis use in terms of health, but also the harms of policy, criminalization, whether that was the appropriate way to control this drug. And that debate has really been lingering uh, or happening for almost half a century now. There were many investigations, reports, legislative uh, reform initiatives in Canada. For those of you who are old enough to remember the Ledain Commission report 1972, it was a specific report on cannabis, which actually recommended legalization of personal use and making cannabis legally available. It was clearly way ahead of its time. Most of the reform initiatives over the last two decades actually had no tangible uh, effect on, on policy change or reform at all. Currently, still very much uh, today, uh, cannabis in Canada is controlled by the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. It's criminal law. It's basically prohibited to use cannabis and provide it in any form. But of course, we have rather erratic enforcement that's mainly been focusing on personal use and young people and criminalized actually a large number of, of uh, young persons um, because of their involvement with cannabis use primarily. So that's a little bit sort of the historical setting. Cannabis use, if you look at the, this is a global map of use prevalence. North America together with Australia has pretty much for a long time been at the uh, head of the at the top of the prevalence league, if you will, use is highest in North America compared to most of the rest of the world. So we've always had very high levels um, of, of cannabis use in Canada, in Canada and the United States. When you actually look a little bit into public health impact, and especially when you compare cannabis to other illegal drugs, you realize, though, this is, you don't need to read all these data. These are from global burden of disease studies by Dagenhardt and colleagues. You basically see that despite much lower prevalence, uh, much higher prevalence, cannabis use actually results in relatively less burden of disease compared to most other uh, illegal drugs. And that is primarily because of 
mortality being relatively limited. First of all, you don't have you have some mortality related with cannabis, but not a lot, not like the narcotics, like opioids and other drugs where you have a lot of overdose deaths. And you don't have uh, common consequences like chronic infectious diseases, HIV and hep C related to injection drug use that you find with the other problems. So despite uh, high prevalence, relatively limited uh, burden of disease. Now. Here's a bit of data on cannabis use here taken from the uh, Ontario general population surveys. They go back the longest and provide comparable data. You see that a number of uh, important things. First of all, if you look at the upper left graph that shows you the use prevalence in the past year, you see that despite uh, persistent criminalization, the use level of cannabis actually has about doubled uh, over the last 20 to 25 years, irrespective of the absence of any policy change or reform. So we've been looking at steeply, not steeply, but persistently increasing uh, rates of cannabis use levels. The other uh, important thing is, of course, for public health, if you look at the graph on the left side below, is that the vast majority of cannabis use happens in the age group of youth and young adults. In other words, 15 to 29 year olds, that's where most of the use is, is present. And that, of course, makes it uh, an enormous challenge for prevention, but also is very relevant for public health and burden of disease outcomes because you have young people using, putting, exposing themselves to cannabis use related risks and the potential burden of disease over the lifespan is, is quite substantial. On the health effects, uh, there are many fantastic works and overviews being written and produced and available to all of you who are interested in the details. Some of them are displayed here. I'll just give you a very, very simple summary. There are cre acute and chronic health effects um, from cannabis that are well defined. The acute ones, primarily cognitive and psychomotor impairments of, of various kinds, um, hallucinations, but cognitive memory, psychomotor control that are relevant for all sorts of activities, both educational as well as things like driving. The risk of injuries and accidents related uh, uh, or occurring uh, under the acute influence of cannabis is about double compared to no use. So that's very well established that risk for injury and accident is elevated under acute impairment. We have the risk for cannabis disorders and dependence. The figure often cited are sort of older data from Jim Anthony that estimated that about one in 10 cannabis users will develop dependence or disorder, although those numbers have gone up a little bit recently. There's psychiatric disorders. We have an association with psychosis and depression, about two, uh, uh, two-fold elevation in terms of risks. Also, it's also clear that for things like psychosis, uh, the majority of those cases are likely not directly or exclusively caused by cannabis, but there are associations with um, uh, trigger effects from predispositions. We have pulmonary and bronchial problems. There may be an association with lung cancer. It's not clear, but definitely chronic users are displaying symptoms of bronchitis and other uh, pulmonary problems. There's emerging literature on pregnancy outcomes, low birth weight, for example, uh, some fetal defects potentially, and some evidence on cardiovascular uh, problems arising. So it's a, a wide array of risks that are associated with cannabis use that are well established. Although the literature has been relatively thin on um, what the actual burden of disease is from cannabis use. So we know a lot about risks that exist, but what it actually means in terms of the impact on population health, that knowledge is relatively limited. What we also know, however, is that, of course, the risks for harms from cannabis use are not equally distributed in the user population. In other words, a large number of cannabis users actually don't develop most of the problems, whereas there are subgroups that develop uh, a, a larger amount of those problems mentioned. And there are, of course, a number of key mediator effects that are at work. 
that we yet have to fully understand, but we know, for example, that intensive use, early use initiation, use patterns outside of certain products, uh, specifications and characteristics, they're all influencing uh, the actual liability or exposure to risks and, and determining harms. And that's, of course, very important for interventions, and we'll, I'll get back to that in a little bit more detail in just a little while. There are also just, so this needs to be mentioned here on the health effects, there's also the emerging arena of synthetic cannabinoids, which have been associated with quite acute and quite severe risks. There has actually, there have been documented incidents of mortality, which is uh, a relatively new thing for the cannabis or cannabinoid field because we had not seen that really much of that directly before. But synthet synthetic cannabinoids being quite potential and bringing new risks primarily also on the cardiovascular front through their uh, sort of high and acute potency. And that is definitely a burgeoning and, and emerging new field in terms of health effects. Now, I mentioned earlier, we know a lot about risks that exist but what is actually the impact on the population level from cannabis use? We uh, started looking into that question a couple of years ago. There's absolutely no data for Canada whatsoever. So we started doing some calculations and epidemiological projections. We triangulated a lot of data because we wanted to know so what really is the, the um, uh, burden of cannabis and how does it relate to different sort of health outcomes that people are concerned about. And so, without boring you with too many of the details of the methods, uh, but we essentially arrived at estimates that suggested to us that, first of all, the most prominent common public health outcomes, negative health outcomes from cannabis use in Canada, this is mostly based on 2010 data, are related to motor vehicle accidents. They're up, we estimated that they're up to about 20,000 injuries that are cannabis caused. Uh, cannabis-associated injuries from cannabis, a couple of hundred fatalities. Uh, we have a large number of cannabis-related disorders, several hundred thousand of cases, most of whom actually are not seeking treatment. Whereas things like psychosis and cannabis-related schizophrenia, even though, of course, every single one of those cases is, is quite severe, um, we estimated that there are probably only about 100 to 200 cases in Canada a year and similar for lung cancer that's really caused by cannabis. So these are basic epidemiological estimates, but what they tell you in their very crude and basic form is that when you look at public health impacts from cannabis, what really matters primarily is driving and accidents in terms of uh, health impacts, including fatalities that are caused by cannabis and cannabis disorders. From a public health perspective, these are mainly the things that matter. This sort of finding was uh, confirmed by a somewhat more sophisticated study that used um, burden of disease methodology, daily adjusted life years, et cetera, which again found that uh, primarily motor vehicle accidents and uh, cannabis use disorders uh, result in the largest amount of burden of disease associated with cannabis versus the other things with somewhat more limited uh, burden of disease outcomes. Now, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, so this is was the public health picture. Now, I take you to my organization, CAMH, in 2014. Canada's largest psychiatric research and teaching hospital, uh, which also has a strong policy commitment. And in 2014, we sat around our policy table and uh, were basically tasked to revise our cannabis position. And we were likely going to end up at a recommendation to uh, recommend or, or reaffirm the commitment to decriminalization or softening of prohibition. And a very intensive discussion actually started in that we realized slowly that um, actually those kinds of approaches relying on decriminalization or tinkering were really not going to do the kinds of things that we should have really been doing for public health. In other words, to really take a comprehensive fundamental reform approach that would be able to address uh, 
all the underlying issues of public health, we realized that decriminalization was not going to get us there, but was really a haphazard measure in many ways that came almost with as many disadvantages as advantages. And we realized that really the, 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 the determined way forward would be with a model of legalization with strict regulation. That's what we ended up recommending uh, from CAMH in 2014, which was a very, very courageous thing to do. You have to appreciate that. That uh, recommendation at that time, during still very different political uh, uh, conditions, coming from a psychiatric hospital, stirred up the pot quite a bit and drew quite a bit of attention. But why did we actually do that? Why did we arrive at that recommendation? So first of all, so a couple of the key points around why we ended up uh, realizing that decriminalization was not going to get us forward. And it's for a couple of key reasons. One of them is, if you look at the different decriminalization uh, uh, models, it's really unclear what their message is. What do you really tell people? What do you tell users primarily? Should you use cannabis or not? Is it a good idea? Should you stay away? Very unclear messaging. Second of all, decriminalization typically still maintains use as an illegal activity, which makes it very, very difficult for public actors, teachers, governments to openly and directly educate and inform people, especially on how to more safely or with less risk use cannabis. In other words, it completely hampers and paralyzes education and information. You have continued stigma and marginalization, but the other key thing is that you can't in any way regulate use or anything that re relates to use, nor can you regulate any products or supplies, which is really a crucial thing to do if you want to address the public health risks related to psychoactive substance. So we arrived at the conclusion that really this wasn't going to get us forward in any way, and that legalization with strict regulation was really the, the, the most inviting or promising concept to really improve public health. And then this man came um, in with uh, what at the time was considered a bit of a crazy idea with the legalization plan as part of the liberal uh, election platform, but obviously it was a successful idea in terms of the overall outcomes of the election. Of course, the government really, uh, I didn't believe it until I really saw the newspaper story that they were going to go forward with it. I will never forget when I received the first email from uh, colleagues at Health Canada with a signature that said, Health Canada's Cannabis Legalization and Regulation Secretariat. I did not think that, that I would ever see an email like that in my lifetime. But uh, it happened. And as you all know, the, the, the action, the efforts to make legalization a reality um, uh, is, is going forward. The decision to legalize was followed by the task force, as with many recent talks that I've given recently, the actual the co-chair of that task force is in the room here, Mark Ware, uh, which developed um, a very sensible and comprehensive framework on how to actually enact legalization and put it into detailed implementation, action, and reality, because there's obviously a lot of things to be figured out to do this and to get it right so that it actually meets the objectives, the explicitly declared ob objectives that legalization would protect public health and public safety. And I can assure you there's a million and one variables at play actually that need to be determined and defined on how to get this right. And even if we think that in theory we have them all right, we will only know when it actually happens whether those goals were met. But I want to talk to you a little bit about some aspects of what some of the key variables of that are and what we're expecting in terms of some of the mechanisms to, to be at work here. So first of all, legalization uh, with an impact or ideally positive impact on public health, what do we need to take into consideration? So first of all, 
there's been a lot of debate and discussions in the media and people always ask me for, so what do you expect, do you think cannabis use will go up? And my answer to people immediately is to that question, for public health, it doesn't matter actually. What matters for public health is actually will harms from cannabis use go up, not use. Use may go up, may go down, but for public health, it's the harm, the acute and the chronic harm outcomes and their prevalence and severity that will actually determine the public health impact of, of, of legalization. There's a very acute and, uh, well, currently acute question whether we have the right systematic and rigorous data indicators and sources in place to systematically monitor that. Um, in, in Canada, we have a rather patchworky framework of largely local and provincial data. There's not a lot of national data sources, even the uh, national drug use surveys that we've had uh, changed about four times over the last 15 years, so a lot of the indicators are not consistent. So there's actually, a, there will be a real challenge for us to arrive and produce truly integrated national comprehensive data to determine whether um, uh, what sort of impacts cannabis legalization will, will really have. We will in no way know before five years down the road what really happened. There are likely going to be straw fire or novelty and curiosity effects. So you'll have to be quite patient actually for a number of years to get a real sort of final assessment of what uh, legalization really, really produced in, in terms of impacts. But of course the devil is also is in the detail very much. In other words, there are many, uh, there's an infinite number of policy levers that are at play that will determine whether um, legalization will really uh, produce positive health impacts. Among them, and I'm just listing a few here that people really need to think about. So first of all, what happens to use and harms in young people? I showed you earlier, that's where use is most prevalent in the young population. Um, that's where exposure to risks and harms is most common. At the same time, uh, and I'll show this with a little bit more data in a second, um, you also realize, of course, that with the emerging regulations, young people are mostly exempt from the be direct benefits or provisions of legalization. We have a lot of cannabis use in people under 19 years of age. Therefore, the question is, what benefits will legalization really produce for the, young, uh, the, the risk group of young people? Cannabis impaired driving will be a big challenge. There's the, the, the general question whether legalization will allow us to really achieve safer and lower risk use among users. Uh, how do we succeed in terms of establishing and moving users to public health oriented supply and distribution is a major challenge for legalization. And then there's the question around interventions. In other words, those people who are at risk for cannabis-related problems or actually have cannabis disorders. Do we have the right tools in place to deal with these people? Of course, we're not operating uh, in a complete uh, vacuum. There's been the experiments in the United States, Colorado and Washington initially. Over the last five years, other states have followed. And basically, in a nutshell, <clears throat> the data that's been emerging from the United States is kind of mixed. On the one hand, it's clear that the world hasn't been coming to an end in those states following cannabis legalization. Uh, at the same time, there are a number of indicators. Here's just a little bit of some data from Colorado, uh, where, for example, uh, traffic related, cannabis related traffic accidents have been rising slightly, use among young people, hospitalizations related to cannabis have been going up somewhat following legalization. So world has not come to an end. At the same time, around certain indicators, we see an increase in certain kinds of problems that are relevant for public health. Of course, so Washington, a little bit similar story around some of the harm indicators. Of course, those data are comparable to the Canadian model only to a very limited extent because the US legalization model is very different from what we have conceptually planned here. It's a commercialization model. There are a lot of the safeguards 
in regulations, the strict regulations that we have planned in Canada that are not in place in the United States. So this will only, the US data can really only serve to a very limited extent uh, as an aid to predict what will ha really happen in Canada. I want to go back to the figures from Ontario, especially about the use prevalence. You see that without policy reform, cannabis use has been going up quite a bit already in a lot of the associated indicators. So we're looking at secular trends that have been happening already without policy reform that uh, uh, may very well influence what will happen under legalization. In other words, if legalization manages to keep use at bay or use-related harms, it will already be a great victory in many ways because it will have stopped trends that have been happening already for the last 20 years. I'll just give one other indicator, for example, if you look at THC content in cannabis products, which we know is uh, a determinant of many of the acute and chronic harms, everything from mental health problems to dependence, those indicators, those THC content indicators, have been going up quite dramatically over the last 25 years. So this has all been happening without any liberalization of policy. If legalization at least keeps those things at bay, we will already have won quite a bit in that we have sort of curtailed ecological trends that were going on. But that's also, of course, something that tells you how carefully data will, be, will need to be evaluated. So if you have data trends that indicate increases in use after legalization or increases in harm indicators, you will really need to evaluate those in the overall context of longer term trends, which makes the story quite complex in many ways. Young people as a key target group. I mentioned already uh, people under 20 years of age have the highest use rates, our most vulnerable uh, target group. In many ways, however, they're the Achilles heel of the current legalization plan because they're not included in any of the direct provisions of legalization. Of course, there's been a convenient political promise. We will legalize, we will make cannabis more available, uh, legally available to adult users. But the other part of the promise was that legalization will serve to keep cannabis out of the hands of young people. I've heard this sentence stated by politicians many times. Whenever I hear it, I ask myself, how will you do that? Why will that happen? There's a lot of reference to better prevention and education, ignoring the fact that, of course, the literature on general prevention and drug education says most of it doesn't really work terribly well. So I think this has been a little bit of a naive or overly opportunistic uh, promise that we will all of a sudden, after 100 years of trying and failing or 50 years of trying and failing and making young people stop using cannabis, that all of a sudden, as of 2018, will find the magic trick to do that. I doubt that it will happen. Um, what we can, I think, realistically uh, hope for is that through improved education and information, more realistic education and awareness, but also through some of the spillover effects from legalization, in other words, that more young people will hopefully have access indirectly to safer supplies, safer use information, that we'll see a little bit of a decline in use and harms in young people, but it will definitely not disappear in that particular age group. Just a little bit of data from the United States, overall the evidence where uh, people have looked at what happened to young people's uh, cannabis use in medical marijuana states versus non-medical states in the US. The evidence really mixed. Some of the studies, uh, conclude that there's really no differential effects from higher availability of, of cannabis uh, versus more restricted availability. At the same time, there's some literature that suggests when you legalize or you liberalize cannabis availability, risk perceptions go down among young people. So <clears throat> it seems to be a little bit of a toss up in terms of speculating what will actually happen in, in young people's uh, cannabis use. One of the almost paradoxical effects of legalization may be that 
the drug and cannabis use becomes less appealing in young people because it's legal and it's become normalized. There may be unexpected effects around those dynamics. Drug prevention or behavioral prevention in general in young people is quite tricky and complex and doesn't work in straight lines. Uh, we, we will need to carefully observe what actually happens in this particular population. Another key challenge is cannabis and driving. I showed you earlier the harm toll, injuries, burden of disease, actual fatalities uh, is quite substantial. And if you look at those data from the Ontario Monitor, overall cannabis, uh, the prevalence of cannabis driving has been stable in the general population. But of course, if you go to the data below, you see that it is most prevalent in young people again. So here, an enormous challenge again to um, uh, to effectively intervene. Now, here, just a little bit of data. We have a number of roadside surveys and emergency room studies that show that uh, in many of those cases where people are admitted to emergency rooms, often cannabis now is more prevalent than alcohol. So the, the acuteness and the prevalence of cannabis involvement in accidents and injuries and potential fatalities has gone up quite a bit and is very, very acute. What needs to be happening? Cannabis and driving is an enormous challenge. We have to dispel many of the myths and provide much more effective education on the risks of cannabis impaired driving, especially to young people. But what we need for effective interventions is we need to provide feasible and reliable roadside testing, uh, ideally through saliva-based testing. There's a lot of lobbyism from the law enforcement community for uh, uh, drug recognition tests that are very complex, they're very costly, and they're very uh, resource intensive. What they definitely cannot do is to provide for reliable or effective deterrence. Those of you who deal a little bit of, with crime or interventions for uh, criminal behavior, know that deterrence relies on a number of key principles, severity, certainty, and celerity. In other words, what we need to do is we need to create a system across Canada where everyone who's getting into a car is realistically afraid that there will be a reasonable likelihood of testing and apprehension if you're cannabis impaired behind the wheel. And I can tell you as a driver, I'm not afraid of that at the moment at all if I was driving uh, with cannabis in my system. We're far away from an effective deterrence system uh, for cannabis impaired driving and upping legal uh, penalties in theory alone will not do that at all. We need to create enforcement and recognition systems on the road that really convey an effective uh, system of, of, of uh, testing uh, and, and apprehension and therefore create uh, effective deterrence together, of course, with social norming. We need to do uh, exactly the same thing that we did with alcohol and driving over the last 40 years, that it becomes enshrined in sort of social values and social behavior that smoking under the, uh, driving under the influence of pot is absolutely not okay, and we're far away from that. Now, a little bit about cannabis supply and distribution. There's been many debates the last and, and uh, emerging uh, pieces over the last few months about how to organize uh, cannabis retail distribution and supply under legalization. And this is really an enormous challenge or a challenge in, in the form of a balancing act. Because what you really need to do is you need to create a legal distribution system that on the one hand, um, provides legally demanded substances with a, a certain ease and availability uh, and, and bring and move people from the illegal markets into legal distribution while at the same time setting the levers right that demand and consumption and subsequent harms are really kept as low as possible. And that is quite a bit of rocket science to figure out how to do that. The challenge is, of course, if you make your legal retail distribution overly restrictive in terms of regulations, access barriers, availability, or if it's simply too unappealing, we're not starting from zero. 
Remind yourselves the competition is in business already. There's a black market that's happening, that's thriving, that's easily available and accessible to people. And legalization could potentially fail quite dramatically if the legal distribution that we're creating will not manage to bring the majority of users into legal outlets in the legal distribution systems. There are factors at play like what products are offered, the pricing, for example, the government has been launching draft plans on that. There are all sorts of uh, variables that will influence the appeal of the legal distribution system, but we have, at this point, really very little idea how those things will play out in practice. I show you here uh, just a, a very simple overview uh, table on the different uh, legal distribution systems that are planned for the provinces in Canada, Canada to the extent that they're available now. You see, first of all, there's quite a bit of variation. Some provinces are going for private models. Some are going for hybrid models. My province, Ontario, has decided to only sell cannabis in the uh, Ontario LCBO system through, through publicly run and managed outlets. I think it's a very, very uh, heavy question whether this very restrictive distribution system in Ontario with very limited outlets and also run by the public monopoly as opposed to regulating and including uh, some of the dispensaries that are of course available in most of the big cities, whether that will be appealing enough to people and open enough also in terms of the cannabis culture to bring the majority of users actually into legal distribution. If that does not happen, uh, we will have quite a bit of problems in terms of the actual feasibility or the desired effects of the, uh, the desired positive effects of legalization because a lot of it will hinge on the question of whether people really access legal, legally regulated and, and, and controlled products. There are a couple of other public health um, concerns or considerations in those emerging regulations that I think have flown under the radar a little bit, but that are, I think, of, of quite some concern or relevance for public health. If you look at the second last column, <clears throat> you will see the restrictions on use, where the provinces allow cannabis to be used under legalization. And in many of the provinces, including Ontario, for example, the only place where you will be allowed to use cannabis will be in private homes. Now, first of all, that defies the idea of many people of cannabis really being a social drug that they want to use with friends or at social gatherings or sort of in public spaces. So the question will be, well, will people comply with this? Or if not, what will happen? But also remind yourselves, we're basically limiting the use of this particular product to an environment where, first of all, we have a lot of young people, we have a lot of non-users of cannabis, but it's also exactly the type of space where we've been trying to remove tobacco smoking for a long period of time. So in many ways, there's a certain paradoxic nature of those regulations at play that I think have been driven a little bit by sort of out of sight, out of mind. I think this is emblematic in many ways for the fact that policymakers still struggle very much with how to deal with this properly and regulate this new form of legal drug use in ways that balances the different objectives and realities of public health. I think limiting cannabis use to private homes only is really not in the good interest in public health and pro will probably backfire. Together with the fact that as part of the supply provisions of the federal law that is going to the Senate shortly, also as a supply component, still has the home growing up to four plants. In other words, we're allowing people to grow cannabis in their homes. You wouldn't do that for any other kind of psychoactive substance. And again, if you want a recipe for diversion or people growing stuff they shouldn't be growing or making their kids eat cannabis, that's probably the way to do that. Is I, I do not understand how this has a place in a public health oriented model for the, the public health oriented regulation of cannabis use and, and, and supply. I think there's a false sort of misguided romanticism at work, but this is part of the current law at the moment and we'll have to see how that plays out. <clears throat> 
A little bit just a comment on cannabis products and routes of use. So there's been um, a, a bit of discussions around those things. It's a very relevant factor uh, for public health outcomes. Remind yourselves that the majority of cannabis currently is still used by burning an organic product and inhaling combusted cannabis into the pulmonary systems. It's really, really not a good thing to do to your body. There are alternatives, routes of use available for cannabis, emerging alternatives like vaping, vaporizers, and e-cigarettes. There are also edibles. A lot of them have been getting a lot of negative attention in many ways. They definitely have their own downsides and risks. However, overall, if you look at it from a public health perspective, anything you can do to bring people away from inhaling smoke combusted cannabis material into the lungs will probably result in an overall public health benefit. There's a lot more we need to understand about vaping, vaporizers, e-cigarette devices, and also edibles. But combined with proper education, information of consumers, and regulating those alternatives, they will probably do a great, or have the potential to do a great deal of benefit for acute and chronic health outcomes. There's a lot of work to be done in that arena, and I don't think uh, our sort of policy makers are on that ball uh, at, at this point, but definitely quite relevant for public health. This is just a, a quick example on probably how to get the supply side uh, of uh, regulation of supply uh, wrong, if you will. It's the, the model of Uruguay. Uruguay has been ignored quite a bit in terms of it's the other country or the country that has legalized already for the past five years. They put a rather similar public health model into place, uh, similar to Canada. Although their supply regulation has been so overly restricted, users had to register with the government. Uh, supply would be available through select pharmacies. There would only be a, a very limited amount of product available. And basically the reality that has, that has emerged in Uruguay is that most people said, well, this is way too restricted and, and too tight for me. I'm just going to keep using the cannabis or obtaining it from the source where I used to get it, which was illegally. And this is one example of how overly tight restrictions on the supply and distribution side actually backfired and undermined the objectives of a public health oriented system. Not a, not a good lesson in how to regulate um, uh, uh, the distribution of legal cannabis. And then of course there's this side of the story. The industry, emerging cannabis industry. At this point, as of yesterday on the Health Canada website, I think we have 76 licensed producers of cannabis. Of course, all at this point, uh, primarily for medical marijuana. Although I can tell you for sure that most of those companies did not invest the billions of dollars just for a medical marijuana market. They were hedging their bets on a vast recreational cannabis market to come. And of course, the question is, what will happen with that industry? I think the marijuana industry at this point is still is relatively strategically smart in sort of conveying to the public that what they're providing is primarily a therapeutic product. But make no mistake, once legalization is here, this industry will look like and act like any other psychoactive drug industry, and of course, the the major uh, other examples here are the alcohol and tobacco industry. It will do what an industry wants to do. It will want as many people as possible to use and buy their products. And despite the fact that we're trying to regulate, the government's trying to regulate things quite tightly, no advertising, no promotion, limiting uh, the characteristics of products, an industry with so much money at stake, will find its ways around those things and will basically act and behave so that it can serve the interest of what now for many of those companies are the accountability to shareholders. Um, this is a, a, a thing, a phenomenon that's been out of the bottle in Canada for a long time. In other words, we could have chosen 
to make marijuana available, for example, through a public monopoly, only a government-run monopoly. But we went the industry route. We're seeing the first signs of mergers of different companies or um, uh, companies merging with uh, alcohol and tobacco industry. So the industry dynamics in this, in this field uh, will be uh, quite tricky and likely actually um, pose many challenges for where this will go in, in terms of public health. I just want to speak a little bit about uh, a couple of aspects of, of treatment and interventions for problematic cannabis use. Um, so here's a little schematic that shows you actually what we're looking at in terms of um, cannabis users and different categories of people developing problems. In essence, the problem or the challenge we have for interventions is that, first of all, in sort of this pyramid of users, these are rough estimates uh, based on epidemiological data, but about 50% or so plus minus of cannabis users are typically occasional or low risk users where there's no major problems really at all. Whereas we have in the top area, we have somewhere between 10 and 25% of users where we're seeing um, relatively serious cannabis use disorders. So these are, this is just a graph from the European Union where cannabis disorders are actually the, the one form of drug use that has been going up in terms of treatment demand. There's a similar data from the United States where the comparisons have shown that over the last 15 years or so, the prevalence of cannabis disorder has also doubled approximately in the US population. And a lot of it is probably related to the fact that THC uh, content has been increasing a lot, but also that the intensity and the frequency of people using cannabis or a subset of the people using frequently and intensively has also doubled approximately over the last 10 years. So we see a lot more demand for cannabis disorder treatment. What tools do we have available for dealing with cannabis disorders? It's actually quite a limited toolbox. There are a number of cognitive, behavioral, psychiatric, uh, motivational interventions available with reasonable effectiveness. But at this point, we really don't have any pharmacological treatment. We don't have an equivalent of methadone treatment, for example, for cannabis disorder, as we have in other areas. So we have a relatively limited toolbox. Um, there are some new pharmacological approaches that are being tested, Sativex, for example, um, has been tested to uh, treat uh, craving and withdrawal with some signals of, of effectiveness. So there are some things on the horizon, but they will take a long time to further explore and, and, and put into clin clinical practice. So it's a relatively limited toolbox that's available. At the same time, what is really ignored in many ways uh, in terms of interventions are sort of the mid-level interventions, not for those people who've already developed a full-blown disorder, but people with risky use. In other words, people who are using frequently, who are engaging in risky use behaviors that is sort of prior to the onset of full-blown disorders. And we know from a variety of studies, primarily from the United States, that brief interventions with those people at risk, in other words, the people in the middle of the pyramid in terms of the risk or problem outcomes, that those can be quite effective. So even with short interventions, we did a study a few years ago with uh, just uh, one basic motivational and information se session plus a booster. There's other things where just two to three interventions were provided to people at risk that actually show relatively positive outcomes and impacts in reducing risk behaviors, reducing frequency, intensity of use, uh, risk behaviors like driving. In Canada, these are unfortunately underutilized, those kinds of brief interventions, even though they're relatively cheap and easy to deliver, in part because our health systems are not designed to deliver them effectively and broadly and don't pay for them. So this is, however, in a public health approach, 
uh, to cannabis where it becomes very expensive once someone develops disorder, all the social and health consequences, the treatment interventions required. Um, this is a part of the intervention spectrum that we definitely have to beef up in order to prevent uh, at least a certain number of people developing full-blown disorders with all the consequences. That's an area of interventions where a lot of development uh, it would be worthwhile. Our low-risk cannabis use guidelines that we developed, which I unfortunately don't have time to talk about now, are one such tool as a population health measure to inform users on an evidence base about risks and what they can do themselves to modify risk behaviors related to their use, in other words, behaviors and choices that are within the user's purview and decision making. This is a public health guy, uh, a tool that we've made available and I can share that with you in uh, offline uh, conversation. There are tools available, so I think I will just leave it at that to not uh, further uh, dig in, into time of, of other speakers. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to elaborate on those. Thank you for your attention. Absolutely. Actually, you alluded to very briefly, but I, I was wondering if you have any indication or if you are actually getting ready to see if, um, which kind of drugs will, uh, the use of which kind of drugs will increase after legalization of marijuana in young people population. Because, I mean, we can expect that this might be a, a side effect of legalization of making you, you it more... You mean non-cannabis drugs? Non-cannabis drugs, yes. Well, what, one of the things I didn't have time to talk about is <laughs> substitution effects. Uh, there are sub positive substitution effects that we're seeing some evidence from related to cannabis. For example, in the U.S., we see some impact in states with medical marijuana, for example, on opioid-related problems and disorders and overdoses. There is some um, not very rigorous evidence on cannabis actually reducing problematic uh, alcohol use, potentially, substitution or sparing effects in, in that regard. So these are the positive things. Your question on what will happen among young people is very good. Uh, it will, this is a very complex thing to figure out, but we have some surveys in place where we will follow those things um, to see what really happens to cannabis use among young people and how may other drugs sort of play into the equation. But I just want to advise great caution here because I think there will be a tendency for people to attribute a lot of things to legalization that are really more ecological type of effects. There's been a lot of change around cannabis use, other drug use that happened outside of those policy changes. So a lot of very careful analysis will need to happen. But it's a very in, in, interesting question. What will happen among young people once legalization comes regards to cannabis use and will other things, you know, fill in the lack of excitement or whatever it is that motivates them for their drug use. <clears throat> oh, sure. Uh, Hi, th thanks very much. That was, uh, that was great. My name is Daniel Weinstock from the Faculty of Law and the Institute for Health and Social Policy. So I think in a way the elephant in the room is young people, but really young people. So, uh, so which part of this equation tell me, is wrong? People under 18 will continue to consume marijuana. Uh, as a matter of fact, the selling point of the Prime Minister during the campaign was, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy that the only time that our kids uh, come into contact with the criminal element is when they go and buy their marijuana. By kids, I think he was referring to people under 18, and yet the way in which the policy is being rolled out, it seems like what we want to do is to try to keep marijuana out of the hands of people under 18. And we're going to fail. 
right? The enforcement. Yes. Um, sure. And what's going to happen, therefore, is that the kids who will continue to smoke marijuana are going to continue to buy their marijuana from the people that they're buying marijuana now from. So we're not going to be keeping them away from the criminal element. We're not going to be giving them access to the regulated marijuana that is perhaps less toxic. So at the end of the day, what are we really doing? Um, if, if, we're, if we're kind of keeping that, if we're playing the ostrich strategy uh, and, um, and, you know, figuring that uh, we're going to keep on calling it illegal there, but we're not going to have the wherewithal to enforce it. Yeah. So hopefully the reality won't be quite as gloomy and we'll be somewhere in a gray between the black and the white. What we can hope for, and for example, the, the alcohol world it. gives some evidence yes. for that, is that even though you're absolutely correct, and as I said, you know, people under 19 will be exempt from the direct access and the benefits from uh, the assumed benefits from legalization, but hopefully there will be some spillover effects, right? So that young people, at least some of them, will now not go to the black market anymore, but get it from their older brother or older friends that will buy, and that the legalization provisions and their benefits sort of spill over into, into that population. But as I said, literally, I think this is the Achilles heel of the plan, because that's in that underage group, that's where cannabis is most prevalent, that's where the, most of the risks are, and that's where the, most of the exposure is, and we're not accessing uh, or providing the benefits directly to people. At the same time, can you imagine a politician who would have had the political guts to say that we should make marijuana legally available to people under 19? That is a political risk that's a lot greater than any potential public health risks, and that's why it's not happening, right? So, but it's unfortunate because that's really where the, the sensitivity and the vulner, vulnerability is, and we'll see what needs to happen in that, in that age group. <clears throat> I've spent the last 25 years since my retirement going to innumerable conferences on a variety of subjects. Inevitably, the bottom line always is the same. Education is the answer. When we're talking about prejudice, when we're talking about poverty, when we're talking about disease, when we're talking about war, it doesn't make any difference what the topic is. It always comes down to the same bottom line. Now, we haven't figured out how to adequately teach people enough mathematics and language to cope, and yet we expect miracles in all these other areas. And my question to you is, what model can you use as an example of effective education in this new area? I don't have any particularly promising models uh, to offer. As a matter of fact, the science on prevention and education shows that it's relatively limited in changing drug use behavior among young people. But I don't think that that's the main question here. I think education needs to be part of the intervention toolbox for cannabis, but we cannot rely on education alone. A lot of this is about regulations uh, in terms of distribution, product availability, how we intervene with risk behaviors like cannabis and driving that are providing as effective as possible mechanics to alter, um, to alter behaviors and alter public health impact. Education's one thing, and I think we have a lot of mistakes to correct where unrealistic or unfactual education was provided to young people about cannabis use, but it, it will not fix this issue on its own. Thank you.